Welcome, brothers and sisters in the family of believers who proclaim the true God in the highest. Yahweh Most High is our Father, and Yeshua, or Jesus the Christ, is our Savior, Master, our King. This is Philip Shields with another message from Light on the Rock, where our focus is on building close relationships with Yahweh, Yeshua, with fellow mankind, especially in our marriages and our families. A week ago, around January 16, I have a very, very, uh, a message that's really weighing heavily on me. Around January 16, just a few days ago, I received an email from a religious group stating that someone there had had a vision or revelation from God. In this revelation, they saw Pittsburgh, the city of Pittsburgh, being destroyed in a huge fireball and a massive destruction on January 19, 2012. So I got the message two or three days before. It was very detailed, very graphic in what exactly was going to happen. I was totally stunned by the brazenness of this. I did not bother mentioning it to anyone, not even my wife. I did not forward the email because I didn't believe it, and I gave it no thought. Except for a couple seconds... It did cross my mind, what if they were given a vision? What's my responsibility? But I'd also been reading in Jeremiah how Yahweh warned against religious leaders who claimed to be speaking for him, who claimed he'd given them words to say. Anyway, I pray for inspiration, by the way, but I do not claim that I'm imparting any kind of vision or that I've had a mysterious voice telling me to tell you all something. No, I've not done that. And I dismissed the email. Well, on Tuesday, the 24th of January, I received another email from the same group, apologizing, repenting for missing something. That was fine as far as it went, but it went on to say how they felt very badly for having given hope to so many and that that hope had not materialized. That made me angry to read that. Hope? Hope that Pittsburgh would be vaporized? Somehow people were disappointed when this great false prophecy didn't materialize? Someone was disappointed that their hope hadn't been accomplished? Are you kidding me? I emailed the group a reply to say that they were... I don't know how they even got my name... to to say that they were vocalizing the very epitome of the Jonah Syndrome, disappointed that hundreds of thousands weren't vaporized with their city. It's almost surreal. It's not like the people of God should be. Brethren, our attitude is not, that attitude is not my Yahweh or yours. Remember when James and John wanted to call down fire from heaven to vaporize a town that had refused them lodging? Yeshua warned them, that's not my spirit, you guys. You don't know what spirit you're of. He said in Luke 9, verses 51 to 56, the son of, then he ended by saying, the Son of Man did not come to destroy. Did not come to destroy lives, but to save them. I bring this up because I get the sense, and I have for a long time, that there's almost a secret glee among some conservative Christians and Messianics and Church of God folks when we see great tsunamis or earthquakes, disasters, tornadoes that uh, that don't usually, uh, in places that don't usually have them, because somehow this is showing we're real close somehow to the time of the end, to the flight, to the place of safety, or some believe the false teaching of the rapture before the tribulation. And there's a secret perverse glee over these horrors that are supposed to be happening by the hand of God. And some of the things that will be happening will be by the hand of God. They will be, some of them. But brothers and sisters, you heard me. That is perverse. It is not of God's Spirit to desire these things. In fact, in Amos 5.18, we're told, Woe to you who desire, look forward to, the day of the Lord. Woe to you who look forward to the day of Yahweh. Woe to you. You know what a woe is? It's a curse. That attitude clearly is one of being what I call a Jonah. 
If you haven't heard my last Sabbath sermon, please be sure to hear it. Are you a Jonah or are you a Matthew? That sermon helped inspire this one. Are you and I acting like a Jonah when it comes to prophecy? Jonah was finally willing to preach the warning message, but only after first he had to be first vomited out. Does that remind you of anybody in Revelation 3? And based on Jonah's reaction when Yahweh spared Nineveh when they repented, I can't imagine Jonah ever, I say Jonah because that's the way the Hebrew name means a dove, I can't imagine Jonah ever praying for or hoping for Nineveh's repentance. Now here's my question. Would you or I have prayed for Nineveh's repentance? We know Jonah didn't preach repentance, but would you have prayed for their repentance even as you preached to them? Would you or would you have been a Matthew inviting them to come to better know, to intimately come to know our amazing Abba, our Father Most High, who is so loving, so merciful, so encouraging, so patient with us. Which would it have been, brethren? I know, I know, I've experienced His amazing forgiveness. Second and third chances He's given me to get my life right. I know, I know, I've experienced firsthand also His spankings. But I've also experienced his long, quiet hugs after the spanking, assuring me of his unquenchable love for me and for you. Any of you who have ever deeply repented after after you've had some pretty bad sins know what I'm talking about. So why would we have glee? Why would we feel any sense of glee? over a spanking about to happen to the whole world. So again, would you have prayed for Nineveh's repentance? You know the answer by answering this question. Have you been praying for your own country's repentance wherever you live? Whether Australia, Britain, Canada, Philippines, Netherlands, or the USA, or wherever you live. Nineveh was given 40 days. We know that Yahweh is going to come with strong discipline for the whole world, starting with his own people. I suspect he's going to start with the church. Based on what I read in Revelation to the seven churches, then he'll spank the modern descendants of physical Israel in the nation of called Israel in the Middle East. And after that, he'll go after the Gentile nations until the whole world will know that there is an Elohim whose name is Yahweh who rules heaven and earth and has come to take over the reins of power through his son Yeshua. That's what we're talking about today. And frankly, I've heard no end of sermons about what's going to happen in the end time. And there's almost a self-righteous glee to think we have some inside knowledge. But I haven't been hearing a lot of sermons over the years urging brethren to pray that our nations repent, that our country repents, that the people in our town and our cities repent, that our leaders of our nation repent. Could that be because we're like Jonah and assume the world is too wicked, so wicked, they're beyond repenting and changing? Have we so minimized the power of God's Spirit to work and to change whole nations if He can change human beings who have been sinners? And yes, I know something about that, and I hope you do too. Is he not changing you? Is he not changing me? The words of God changing you, changing me. Can it not do that to a whole nation that repents? Is it because we assume that since we have the detailed books of Daniel and Revelation and all the prophets and the apostles' prophecies, that surely it's too late for even Yahweh himself to change any of it? The die is cast, the script's been written, the play has begun, the orchestra's playing, and it's simply too late, we think. Is that what you think? I believe so, for some of you. The evidence clearly shows that many of the ecclesia, the called out ones, believe it's too late. 
for Yahweh to change his mind now. Too late, even if his people would pray for their own forgiveness first, and then the forgiveness of the called out ones, and then the forgiveness of our own nations. That's what you really think, don't you? And that would make you a Jonah. If you think like that, that would make me a Jonah if I think like that. Well, in this teaching, I want to challenge that thinking. I don't want to be a Jonah. I don't want you to be a Jonah. I don't want to assume our peoples can't repent in enough numbers and fervency to change the course of history. I don't want to assume that we can't see a repeat of the story of Nineveh and how Yahweh changed his mind and did not destroy a vast city. In this teaching, I also want to challenge you with the question, when have you ever prayed for your countrymen, for your whole country to repent and for Abba to be merciful to them? When have you ever prayed for your nation? When I was about 14 or so, I'll never forget what happened. I remember hearing my mom sobbing in her bedroom. I knocked quietly and I opened the door slowly and I peered in. My mom was a single mom at that point, divorced. I peered in to see my mom kneeling beside her bed and sobbing. I slowly went in, I inched my way beside her and I said, Mom, uh, are you okay? What's the matter, Mom? She'd gone through a horrific divorce, was trying to raise four kids on her own, but I had no idea what was really bothering her so. She sighed heavily and then she said, Philip, I'm just begging God, please be merciful to our nation just pains me to see the way we are, the way we treat him, and to know what's going to come on our nation because of our sins. I was just praying that Father would lead our nation to repentance so he could forgive us and all the things we know are going to happen maybe wouldn't have to happen. That experience... They had planted the seeds for this sermon. About 40 some years later. I'll never forget that moment. Other than that moment, I can't recall anyone else who spoke of praying that our Abba lead his people in a national way to repentance and to forgive their sin. There have been glimmers of it by some during what's called the National Day of Prayer that we still observe. I think it's every May. Every May. But other than that, I can't say I've seen much of it and certainly not among the Church of God groups who seem all too happy to have things come about. Maybe we cover that up or camouflage it by saying that, you know, that just means Christ will be here sooner. That's the good news. That's why we're happy. Well, I don't know, brethren. So back to my question. Is it too late for our people to repent and for Yahweh to stop the carnage He has prophesied? Is it too late What if God's people would pray for the nation? Would he hear those prayers? Would they have any impact? Already many of you are probably thinking I'm wacko. I'm not. I know my Father. He's a merciful God who sometimes very, very quickly forgives and forgoes some of the punishment he's already stated would happen. Even wicked King Ahab got a reprieve. King Manasseh, very evil, one of the most evil, when he humbled himself, he was forgiven and restored to his position as a vassal king. And again, Yahweh changed his mind for evil Nineveh when they repented. The scriptures are in my notes here. What would it mean if enough of our people would repent? And if God changed his mind, we'd have to throw out all our prophecy charts, wouldn't we, that we worked so hard on? Oh my! And what if we didn't have to go through the total devastation that's prophesied on the whole world? Some of you think that because you're counting on escaping all these things that are about to happen, you maybe don't care so much about the subject. You're so relying on there being a place of safety and going to it to save your skin that you forget that we may well have to go through much more than we first realize now before we even get to any place of safety. And if you're thinking to save your own skin, you'll lose it according to our Savior. He who seeks to save his life shall lose it. 
it'll, it, 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 it'll get real clear as we go along, too, that if we don't care about the people around us, we won't be part of those counted worthy to escape the coming wrath either, brethren. So this sermon is about showing that we really care for everyone else around us. I don't think that even 1% of God's people are anywhere near ready, mentally or spiritually or in any other way, for the total upheaval of every system we know, our economic system, our religious freedoms, the value of our money, the availability of edible food, the availability of clean drinking water, our government, our roads, our homes, our cities, our jobs, even our very friends. All of this is about to be impacted totally so that the, your own brothers and sisters, a father will, will betray his own son, a mother her own daughter to save their own lives, members of our own household will be putting us to death according to your Savior. We're not ready for that. We're not ready for it. We will all be going through far more of this than I think we realize now, even if we go to a place of safety, but I'll speak more of that on this in a future sermon. Now, I'm not saying that I believe, I'm not saying that we shouldn't take God's words very, very seriously. I do believe Yahweh's words are sure. I'm not saying he'll postpone his wrath over and over and ever forever. In many scriptures, such as Ezekiel 12, 21 to 27, Yahweh makes it clear the time is coming when the final countdown of events will start happening and he's not likely to be dissuaded. I've been reading the book of Jeremiah a lot the last few weeks. I've been reading the book of Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah and, Hosea and Obadiah and other books lately. And, and it just is strikingly clear what a violent time we're about to enter into. And we aren't ready for it. I believe Yahweh's way, words are sure. I do believe. Neither am I saying our, our Father is a softy. Scripture is clear that our Father is the most compassionate, forgiving, patient God overall. But it's also clear that though he's slow to wrath, boy, you don't want to get him angry. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I am saying this very clear to me that the Father's patience has just about had it. I've been reading the books of Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and in those books it's so clear that he wants us to know that in these last days he is really, really, really ticked off. So I'm not saying in this sermon that the likelihood of national repentance is high, but it is clear that it's possible and even sought and desired by Yahweh, as I'll show. It is clear our Elohim, our God, does not delight in the death of the wicked. It is clear He would rather have our repentance and forgive us and punish us. It is clear that His heart is set on His children and chosen people. It is clear we have not only angered our Maker, but we've really, really hurt His feelings by the callous way we've treated him. <clears throat> I, mean, I was reading verses even in Numbers and, and Exodus and Jeremiah. How long will these people reject me? In Malachi where he says, even an ass, even a donkey knows its master. But my people don't know me. I hear and I feel a deep hurt, not just anger, but a deep hurt in my Father. After all He's done for us. In some future sermon I will read the dozens of verses where He bears His heart, bears His soul as it were, and you feel His pain. It's clear that He's furious over the many idols and the gods we've set up in our lives. He's angry at our violence, including killing a third of a million unborn babies in a recent year. He's had it with the way we polluted and destroyed our creation, our greed, our callous disregard for His commands, the way we treat one another, and the needy and the orphans and the widows and the strangers in the land. He's had it with that, with our nations, and He's getting ready to spank 
<clears throat> so hear me. I'm not saying he can't get angry or that he's a soft touch. When Yahweh has had it with us, when Yahweh gets angry, and he does, we're about to get the spanking of our lives. And Yahweh is slow to anger, slow to spank, but when he does, boy, he spanks hard. You cannot read about how he punished ancient Israel and Judah and think otherwise. And before Yeshua returns to the Mount of Olives, we will be faced first with Satan's wrath, the great tribulation, and some of God's children will be, faced in, will be placed into the place of safety. It seems. Not everybody, though. In Revelation 12:17, it says, Satan, or Satan, goes after the remnant of the church and describes them as those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 12:17. They will go through the worst time of torture and trouble. Those people who are not in a place of safety, they will go through the worst time of torture and trouble the world has ever seen. There will be many who will be martyrs as they witness for Yeshua. Do you know the word witness, by the way, comes from the Greek word marturos, martyr? Did you know that? That the people who were witnesses were also martyrs, and martyrs were witnesses, okay? It means more today than just the same thing, but back then, witness was marturos in the, or in the, in the Greek. John the Baptist was beheaded after all. Beheading will be the preferred method of execution. So why shouldn't we have to face it? Many of our forefathers did. Many of them were beheaded. Many of our brethren once more will show their willingness to die for the truth and for the name of our God. The fifth seal of Revelation is all about this martyrdom and wrath of Satan. And then we have Yahweh's wrath, the day of the Lord, the day of Yahweh, the sixth seal. And uh, beyond, the seventh seal, the, you know, the, the sixth seal is the signs in heaven, I think, then the seventh seal, and so on. By the time he's done with this earth and its people, there will probably be no cities left to standing. Whole mountain ranges will be gone. Talk about the scope of the earthquakes that would cause all that. Boy, numerous islands will disappear. Most of the crops will be destroyed, and the green grass and the trees, it says, and the rivers and the streams and the waters and the oceans, be between natural and man-made disasters and nuclear war, it's going to be a total mess. No wonder, Scripture says, Woe to you who desire the day of the Yahweh. Amos 5.18. Woe to you. So hear me, brethren. I know this is all coming. I know there's a coming great martyrdom. I know there's coming a great time of God's anger. And the Bible speaks of God's love and His goodness as well as His severity. Romans 11.22 The goodness of God and the severity of God. Romans 11.22 So I don't take... So don't take this sermon to mean that Philip Shields thinks Father is a pushover. Not in the least. But I do know there was a story of Nineveh. And I do know the stories of other times Yahweh changed His mind when He saw the heart a bunch of people who had turned back to him. <clears throat> I do know he does not delight in the death of the wicked. Let's read this in Ezekiel 33, Ezekiel 33, verses 10 and 11. Therefore you, O son of man, say to the house of Israel. Now who's the house of Israel today? Who's the Israel of God today for that matter? I think all the way through this sermon, I want you to think about this both physically and spiritually. The temple has a spiritual and a physical type. Israel is physical and spiritual. Say to the Son of Man, O Son of Man, say to the house of Israel, thus you say, if our transgressions and our sins lie upon us and we pine away in them, how can we then live? Say to them, as I live, says Adonai Yahweh, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, repent, turn from your evil ways. Why should you die, O house of Israel? That's my Father's heart. Knowing this, I preach this sermon. We need to pray that our nations repent. If you and I are like Abba, we won't desire the death and destruction about to happen either. 
we certainly won't have any sense of glee with it or have hope coming up because of it. So will you join with me and start immediately praying that our city and your country and your state or your province and your nation will repent? Will you join with me? Pray for our president. Pray for your prime minister that they will come to their senses and lead the nation. I know, I know, brethren, it sounds so impossible, so improbable, but brethren, that's what Jonah thought about the Ninevites and their king too. Let's not be like he was. So let's look at some of the many, 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 many people in the Bible who prayed for the countries around them and the cities around them. In a way, Abraham did. Read Genesis 18 with that in mind. He had a direct conversation, prayer, if you will, with Yahweh, who came and had lunch with him, and he asked for Sodom to be spared. Abraham prayed that Sodom be spared. If there would be ten righteous in the city, would you have prayed for Sodom? In Revelation 11, it calls Jerusalem modern-day Sodom. In Ezekiel 16, it calls our nations modern-day Sodom nations of Israel and Judah. Would you have prayed for Sodom? Are you praying for the equivalent cities today? Already some of you are giving quick comebacks as to why Genesis 18 was different. But all they needed was just 10 in the whole city. Just 10. How many people would have to repent in America before God would change his mind? Would it have to be millions and millions and millions? Just 10. What if 10% of our nation repented? How about this one? Yahweh himself is telling our nations to repent. In a sense, he's the one praying for our own repentance. Shouldn't we heed him? Let's go to Ezekiel 18, verses 27 to 32. Ezekiel 18, verses 27 to 32. When a wicked man turns away from the wickedness he's committed and does what's lawful and right... He preserves himself alive. Ezekiel 18, verse 28 now. Because he considers and turns away from all the transgressions which he committed, he shall surely live. He shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, The way of the Lord is not fair. O house of Israel, is not my, are not my ways, uh, it's not my ways that are, uh, wait now, is, is it not my ways which are fair or your ways which are not fair? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, says Yahweh Elohim. Repent and turn from all of your transgressions, so that iniquity will not be your ruin. He's, he's saying to Israel, house of Israel, repent. Now remember the house of Israel had long gone into captivity by the time Ezekiel's writing this. Long gone into captivity. So this is a prophecy for our day. Repent. Repent, America. Repent, Britain. Repent, Canada. Oh, Netherlands, will you repent? Denmark, Sweden, and Holland, will you repent? Australia, repent. Turn from all your transgressions so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Ezekiel 18.31, cast away from you all the transgressions which you've committed. Get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why should you die, O house of Israel? I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says Yahweh Elohim. Therefore turn and live. Do you feel Father's heart here? Why should you die, O house of Israel? I'm not going to like doing what I have to do. I, I'm a, also a, not just a merciful God. He's saying I'm also, I'm also a just God. But I don't want to have to spank. Just say you're sorry, repent, turn around, change. Surely it could stop the message right there. Yahweh himself is saying to the nation, it's not too late. Repent. Now I fully realize there are verses in Jeremiah, at least three times where Yahweh says, don't even try praying for these people because I've had it with them. 
they're going to get punished. I know those verses. I just read them last night again. But I also think Yahweh is showing himself as a father who knows he's going to have to spank, but also like a loving father when he sees his children are truly sorry, the spanking may not come after all or may not last so long or be as hard. I hope you're not offended by the spanking example. The Bible is clear that, there, that a loving father will discipline his children. <clears throat> not just with timeouts. It talks about the rod of correction. In Jeremiah 7 and 11, Yahweh tells Jeremiah not to pray for the people. You can read it again in Jeremiah 14, verses 11 and 12. You might, might want to write that down. Jeremiah 7 and 11 and 14. Those three chapters all have verses. Jeremiah 14, verses 11 and 12, that talking about Jeremiah. I don't even want you praying for these people. I won't hear you. And yet in the very same chapter, in Jeremiah 14, 11 and 12, Yahweh tells Jeremiah, don't even bother praying for them. Yet in the very same chapter, Jeremiah 14, verses 19 to 22, Jeremiah does pray for the nation using the very words Yahweh gives him. He says in Jeremiah 14, verses 19 to 22, I'll read parts of it. Have you utterly rejected Judah? Has your soul loathed Zion? This is a prayer to God, to, to Yahweh. Why have you stricken us so there's no healing in us? We looked for peace, but there was no good. We looked for a time of healing, and there was trouble. We acknowledge, O Yahweh, our wickedness and the iniquity of our fathers, for we have sinned against you. Don't abhor us, abhor, abhor us for your name's sake. Don't disgrace the throne of your glory. Remember, do not break your covenant with us. And he goes on from there in verse 22, uh, Jeremiah 14, verse 22. <clears throat> Are there any among the idols of the nations who can cause rain? Or can the heavens give showers? He's trying to remind God, we know who you are, we know you're powerful, and we know we were sinners. Are you not he, O Yahweh, our God? Therefore we will wait for you since you have made all of these. But like I said, Yahweh's finally had it at this point. The very next verse, look at what Yahweh says to him. I'm aware of this is what I'm saying to you. In Jeremiah 15.1, there were no chapters and verses back then. <clears throat> Yahweh said to me, even if Moses and Samuel stood before me. And these were two who had profound impact on God when they prayed for the nation, as we'll see. My mind would not be compassionate or favorable towards these people. Cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. So, there you have it. Some of you are saying, well, there you have it, Philip. Shut the sermon down. Yahweh doesn't want us praying for this evil world and this evil nation. Well, I totally disagree. If you keep reading in Jeremiah, which I've done lately, over and over and over, our Yahweh pleads with the nation to repent. And yet he kind of knows he's going to have to spank, but he pleads for them to repent. Just three chapters later, we read Jeremiah 15, 1, and Jeremiah 18, verses 5 to 11. In this very same book, where Yahweh is saying they're not going to change, it's too late. He says here in Jeremiah 18, verses 5 to 11, I just feel his anguish. I just feel the inward turmoil Father's going through. A loving dad who really doesn't want to hit his child too hard in discipline. Really wants the child to change and go the other way. Jeremiah 18, 5 to 11, and the word of Yahweh. The word of Yahweh. Remember that, my sermon on, on how Yeshua was hiding in plain sight? Then the word of Yahweh came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? And he says, um, look, you're like a clay uh, in my potter's hand, so you're in my hand, O house of Israel. Jeremiah 18, verse 7. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it. Jeremiah 18, 8. The instant, I say I'm going to do that, verse 8 now, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and a kingdom to build and plan it, 
If it does evil in my sight, so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit it. And I want you to notice a couple things. He is saying, yes, I will even have said these things, but if you change, then that will change what I have said. I won't do what I have said, just like what happened in Nineveh, you see. Now, therefore, speak to the men of Judah, Jeremiah 18:11. Speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says Yahweh, Behold, I am fashioning a disaster and devising a plan against you. Return now. He's pleading with them. Return now, every one of you, from his evil way. Make your ways and your doings good. Brethren, are we hearing him? Are we hearing Abba? He wants the nation to repent. He doesn't want to have to do what he said he's going to do. He's offering a chance for repentance. I'm not hearing a lot of others saying it. It's time we pastors speak up for the repentance of our nations. There are many, many more examples of prayers on behalf of the nation. Moses is famous for it. You all know the story in Exodus 32, verses 9 to 12. <clears throat> Moses had been up there 40 days and 40 nights. Yahweh's talking about the tabernacle and all the things he's going to have to be getting ready in the meantime. He, he had married, Yahweh had married Israel. And, and, and within those 40 days, his new wife, the nation of Israel, has made a golden calf. And God gets so mad, Yahweh says to Moses, Ezekiel, I mean, Exodus 32, verses 9 to 12. I've seen, the, I've seen this people, and indeed it's a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone. Leave me alone, he says, that my wrath may burn hot against them and may consume them. And I'll make you a great nation. And Moses pleaded with Yahweh, his Elohim. Notice, remember, I talked, gave a sermon about taking ownership and possession and, 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 and identification with, might be a better word, with our Father. He is our Elohim. He's our God. Anyway, Moses pleaded with Yahweh, his Elohim, and said, Yahweh, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt? <clears throat> with great power and with a mighty hand. Over and over, Moses prayed for this nation. You know the story where I can read many examples where Moses even said, if you don't walk with us or go with us, I don't even want to continue. In Numbers 14, after the nation was rebelling upon hearing the bad report of the 10 out of 12 uh, spies, and they were getting ready to stone Moses. In Numbers 14, I'll pick up the story there in verses 11 to 13. And Moses and Aaron, by the way, in Numbers 14, you can read how they were flat on the ground, face on the ground. <clears throat> Yahweh said to Moses, How long will this people reject me? And how long will they not believe me? How many more signs do I have to perform among them? I will strike them with the pestilence, and I will disinherit them, and I will make you a nation greater and mightier than they. He'd already done that with the golden calf incident. This is some years later, and he's saying it again. And Moses said to Yahweh, then the Egyptians will hear it, for by your might you brought, blah, 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 blah. I mean, Moses is not having anything to do with that. Another time, in two chapters later, in number 16, the story of Korah's rebellion and how God killed Korah and the 250 and, and uh, they were with, allied with Korah. If you're not familiar with the story, you can go back and read it in number 16. Moses, we think of him as a, some great, fantastic leader today, but there were time and again and time and again that the people wanted to stone him. He was not uh, the most popular, lead, popular leader. He just was not. Not while he was alive. <clears throat> anyway, Yahweh also told Moses and Aaron to get away one time. Okay, in this example... All these people come up the next day or soon after and they say, oh, you killed Moses, you killed all these men. These were men of God. So let's read it and see what happens. Number 16, verses 41 to 50. I'm just giving examples of how Moses prayed for a very wicked and unrepentant nation. 
<clears throat> Number 16, the 250 are dead now. Korah's dead. On the next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel, it says all the congregation, complained against Moses and Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of Yahweh. Now it happened when the congregation had gathered against Moses and Aaron that they turned towards the tabernacle of meeting and suddenly the cloud covered it and the glory of Yahweh appeared. <clears throat> and then Moses and Aaron, I'm in number 16, verse 43, <clears throat> excuse me. Then Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of meeting. Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, get away from this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. Get away from them. It's God's command. Moses did not get away. He fell, they fell on their faces, on the ground again. So Moses said to Aaron, quick, he says, take a censer, put fire in it from the altar, put incense on it, and take it quickly, quickly, Aaron, to the congregation. Make atonement for them. Wrath has gone out from Yahweh. The plague has begun. Hurry, Aaron, hurry! He's killing them! Then Aaron took it as Moses commanded, ran into the midst of the assembly. And already the plague had begun among the people, so he put the incense and made atonement for the people. And he stood, Aaron did, between the dead and the living. So the plague was stopped. Now those who died in the plague were 14,700, besides those who died in the Korah incident. So Aaron returned to Moses at the door of the tabernacle of meeting, for the plague had stopped. God had heard Moses and Aaron's prayer. God had told Moses and Aaron, get away from them. I'm going to wipe them out. Moses and Aaron had no part of that. Moses said, Aaron, hurry. Hurry, Aaron, hurry. And Aaron stood between the dead and the living with this horrible plague going through the midst. That took guts. That took love. Love. A love for people that were willing and ready to kill them. Brethren, when we see the plagues coming to our nation, the hurricanes, the tornadoes, the dirty bomb attacks that will come, the terrorism in our land that will come, the earthquakes, the droughts, the famines, the floods, will we be standing in the midst of the plague as Aaron did, begging for Yah's mercy on his people? I hope so. That's the spirit of a true child of Yahweh. Even when they were ready to stone him, Moses kept praying for them. In Numbers 21, 7, this was a time when the plague of serpents was going through. And it says, Moses prayed for the people. Numbers 21, 7, the time the serpents were all in the camp, the people repented and asked for prayers and forgiveness. In this case, would you and I have prayed to them, or would you and I have said, huh, after all you've done, you deserve this. Get out of here. You know the sad, sad thing of all? To me, this is so sad. When Yahweh announced the punishment on Moses for striking the rock instead of speaking to it, and that Moses would not be allowed to enter the promised land, there's no record that I'm aware of of a single person interceding in prayer for him. But he did it over and over and over for all Israel. Let that sink in. But you say, Yah, Philip, but the children of Yahweh today 
aren't the national stubborn Israelites. We're the ecclesia. We're the called out ones. It's not the nation of Israel or the ten tribes anymore. Many of us believe the United Kingdom, UK, Northwestern nations of Europe, Canada, Australia, those are the... No, it's not It's not that anymore. The, the Israel of today, the children of Yahweh today, is, is the church. Uh, his called out ones. He's really pleased with the church right now. And uh, he's, he's not... All these things about praying, you know, it doesn't apply because we're, we're the church. He really likes the church. He really likes the, 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 the bride. Really? Is that what you read in Revelation 2 and 3? He loves his bride, yes. The bride for Jesus, yes. But are we really as what we should be yet? Turn now to 1 Samuel 12. So there's some more examples of people praying. Samuel tells us something very, very instructive. He says... Well, let's read it. First Samuel 12, verses 19 to 25. They had just picked a king to rule over them, and now they're beginning to realize, uh-oh, we may have gone a little too far here. And so uh, that's the context. First Samuel 12, verses 19 to 25. All the people said to Samuel, Pray for your servants to Yahweh your Elohim, Yahweh your Elohim, that we may not die, for we've added to all of our sins the evil of asking for a king for ourselves. And then Samuel said to the people, Do not fear, you have done all this wickedness, yet don't turn aside from following Yahweh, but serve Yahweh with all your heart. And don't turn aside, for then you would go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver, for they are nothing. For Yahweh will not forsake his people for his great name's sake. The name of God means something. The name of Yahweh, because it has pleased Yahweh to make you his people. I'm reading 1 Samuel 12, now verse 23. 1 Samuel 12:23 Moreover as for me far be it from me that I should sin against Yahweh by ceasing to pray for you but I will teach you the good and the right way only fear Yahweh serve him in truth and so on My point is verse 23 Far be it from me that I should sin against Yahweh by not praying for you There you have it. When was the last time you prayed for your country? Have you ever done that? Brethren, it's time to start. If you're not, if we're not, we're sinning. That's what Samuel said. Lots and lots of examples of different ones praying for their country and their people. Even Jeremiah, who was told at least three times not to, Once he saw what happened to Jerusalem and he wrote the book of Lamentations, watching what was going on around him. In Lamentations 3, boy, the whole book you could read, but Lamentations 3, verses 47 to 50. Fear and a snare have come upon us, desolation and destruction. Lamentations 3, 47, 48, 50. My eyes overflow with rivers of water. Did he care about his people? My eyes overflow with rivers of water for the destruction of the daughter of my people. My eyes flow and don't cease without interruption until Yahweh from heaven looks down and sees. This is what I'm talking about. Paul said, read this with your own eyes in Romans 9 verses 1 to 5. Romans 9, verses 1 to 5, we're talking about the Apostle Paul now. I'm just giving examples of example after example. God himself, Samuel, Moses, Aaron, Paul, Jeremiah. Here's Paul, Romans 9, praying for the nation. I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have a great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. I could wish that myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. He's talking about physical Israel here, the nation of Israel. He says, I would give up my salvation. I would give up my salvation if that would guarantee that all these people would be saved. 
Theirs, after all, is the adoption of sons. Theirs is the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. But did you notice what he said? I am in deep sorrow and anguish in my heart. I really, really want my nation to come to salvation. And then in Romans 10, verse 1, some naysayers will say, yeah, but he's still not praying for him. Well, these people simply don't know their scriptures because they need to keep reading. Romans 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for Israel is that they all be saved. My heart's desire and my prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Means they have to repent first. My prayer, he's praying for him. But anyway, Paul says his heart's desire and prayer is that Israel be saved. When was the last time you prayed that prayer? You see, Paul would agree with this sermon. Paul was not a Jonah. It's something he did. It's something his heart was in. That's what this sermon's about. Now again, why should we be praying for this nation? Because we're God's children, called by his name. <clears throat> and when we pray, I hope there's a better chance that he will hear those prayers. Of course, we should be praying our hearts out. Yahweh actually tells us in the recorded dream to Solomon that he's willing to relent even after he begins punishing us with our, because of our sins. When we read this, remember, we are the house of God. Remember, Solomon's dedicating the house of God, the house of Yahweh, the temple. And, he's, and, and, and then right after that, Yahweh appears to him in a vision and says some very encouraging and insightful things that we still read today. But when you read, when we read what we're going to do soon, uh, Paul's, I mean, the, the words to Solomon... Don't forget that today the temple of God is the church. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says that. You are the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 3.16. And if you defile that temple of God, he will destroy you, it says. For the temple, your body, is holy. Which temple you are. So we've got to be taking care of our bodies and our health that we have. The temple Solomon built used to be called the house of the Lord or the house of Yahweh. God's house. And we're also told in 1 Timothy 3, verse 15, that we, the church, the ecclesia, is the house of God, the house of the living God. 1 Timothy 3, 15. We are the house of the living God. Now, for that matter, when you read Yahweh's words to Solomon about Israel, remember then, that the ecclesia, the called out ones, is the temple of God and the Israel of God and the house of God. Now, so I'm going to add another dimension. The spiritual Israel of Yahweh, the called out ones, is also called, is also called, you know, spiritual Yahweh, is, uh, the, the church is also called spiritual Israel, is what I'm trying to say. Now, as we're praying for the nation, I hope you heard what I said in the beginning, that we need to be praying on a spiritual level and the physical level. Does the body of called out ones, the church, the assembly, the congregation as I prefer to call them, is it in dire need of fervent prayer? I think so. Are we united? Are we unified? No, we're the splintered church. I even hesitate to add the words of God, splintered church of God. We're the splintered church. Messianics are no better. We're not demonstrating unity and harmony and love and getting together and humility. And No, no, we're not. So there's a lot to repent of even in the church, brethren. There really is. There really, truly is. About the church, I mean, a lot to repent about. So what we're about to read applies nationally as well as spiritually. So let's read that in Second Chronicles 7, parts of verses 12 to 22. Then Yahweh, first, Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles 7, verses 12 to 22. Then Yahweh appeared to Solomon by night and said, I've heard your prayer 
And I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. Remember, we are the house of sacrifice today, according to 1 Peter 2.5. Okay? Anyway, when I shut up heaven and there's no rain, and when I command the locusts to devour the land, remember I said earlier that some of these things will be by the hand of God, or send pestilence among my people. If my people, now who are his people? Sure, there's national Israel, but who really are his people? He's saying, you guys better be praying. If my people, called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and give a whole sermon on that, and turn from their wicked ways. Those of us in the church, if we would seek his face now more diligently than ever before, if we will pray with all of our might and turn from our wicked ways, we all still have wickedness that we have to overcome, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Remember, we are his people, brethren. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. In what place? In the temple, in the house of God. What's the house of God? What's the temple? It's the church, brethren. When I say the church, I mean the, 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 the true church, the called out ones who are obeying him and, and uh, living by faith. Verse 16, for now I've chosen and sanctified this house, the temple, that my name may be there forever. It's called the house of Yahweh. That's what it was called, the house of the Lord, the house of Yahweh. That my name, Yahweh, may be there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there. My heart will be there perpetually. Continue reading on through verse 22 where he has some warnings to the church and to the nation. And he did cast out those people. But my point is, he says here, if my people would pray, brethren, that there's impact in your prayers. We're his people. We need to use our relationship with Yahweh to intercede like Moses did for the nation, both for the physical and spiritual Israel. But don't think that since we're the church, supposedly the bride of Christ, that we can somehow all be smug and that there's no harm that was going to befall us because we're the temple of the Lord, the house of God. You better think again. You can read that in Jeremiah 7, the first four verses, where Jeremiah is told by Yahweh the word that came to Yahweh from came to Jeremiah from Yahweh, saying, "Stand in the gate of Yahweh's house, and tell these people, hey, quit saying that you don't have to worry about anything because we've got this temple here." Remember that they had that attitude that they uh, when the ark was taken in a battle with the Philistines, as long as we have the, the ark with us, God's not going to let us lose. Well, they did lose. And so he says in verse 4, don't trust in these lying words saying the temple of Yahweh, the temple of Yahweh, the temple of Yahweh are these. And what I mean by reading this is that some of us are thinking we don't have anything to worry about as long as we're in the church. As long as we're in the church, we're okay. The temple of Yahweh, the temple of Yahweh, the temple of Yahweh are these. That's the same thing, brethren. That's as applicable today as ever. Yahweh is faithful to his word. If we don't care if anyone else says this, and I don't care if anyone else says this, it's time someone say it. If enough people in our nation today and in the church today, wherever our nations are, will hear this message and will repent, we could still see a repeat of the miracle of Jonah's preaching when Yahweh was merciful to a very, very violent and sinful city-state called Nineveh. It's not too late. Or have you lost faith? How about Daniel, Nehemiah, Hezekiah, and Josiah? We know we have so many prayers about these, more than we have time to read. But the key to the successful prayer for the nation is to copy the formula used by Nehemiah and Nehemiah and Daniel. The formula basically was that they started by admitting their own sins first. Always start by asking your own forgiveness. Even a priest going into the temple or tabernacle had to first wash his own hands and feet and had to sacrifice his own animals for himself you know, the, and all that before accepting it for everybody else. 
And then, anyway, you had to go in there clean. You, had to go, you know, they took their shoes off and, and worked barefooted, and they were given clean garments, uh, uh, priestly garments that we, they wore in there. So you have to get yourself right first with God, and then you remind Yahweh what a gracious and forgiving Elohim he is, and then you ask him to bring the nation to repentance and to ask him to forgive the nation. That's what they did. Let's turn and look at a, a fresh look at Joel 2. Joel 2, verses 15 to 17. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, Joel 2, 15 to 17. Gather the people. Gather the people? We're spreading the people out. We're scattering, we're splintering. Like God says, gather the people. Stop this splintering nonsense. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and the nursing babes. Every single person, gather them. Let the bridegroom get out of his chamber. I don't care if you just got married. I don't care if you're consummating your, your marriage. This is more important, he's saying. And let the bride come out of her dressing room. You guys, now's the time to be doing this, he says. Nothing is more important. That's what he's trying to say here. Let the priests who minister to Yahweh weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, Spare your people, O Yahweh. He's saying, let the priests... Who are the priests today, brethren? We are a royal priesthood. We are a royal priesthood. He's saying, let the priests... That's you, brethren. That's you who minister to Yahweh. That's you, brethren. That's you. Weep between the porch and the altar. Let you say, Spare your people, O Yahweh. Do not give your heritage to reproach, that the nation should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Joel is saying, you guys, Yahweh is telling me to tell all of you, start praying for the country. Spare your people, O Yahweh. Spare your people. You priests, start praying this. You bridegroom and bride people, get out here and, and leave where you are now and start to fast and pray for this because some terrible, terrible times are about to come. Isaiah 62, verses 6 and 7. Isaiah 62, verses 6 and 7. I have set watchmen on your walls of Jerusalem. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of Yahweh. Whoever makes mention of Yahweh, it's the children of Yahweh who do. You who make mention of Yahweh, of, 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 of the Lord, of Yahweh, do not keep silent. Give him no rest until he establishes, until he makes Jerusalem a praise in all the earth. That's a beautiful song. I have these verses to a beautiful song. You who make mention of Yahweh, do not keep silent. Give him no rest. That means we're really, really praying hard and a lot. When Yahweh sent His Son, Yeshua, to the earth, what was His example? We know what He prayed on the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing, Father. And Paul said, had they known what they were doing, they would not have done it. They didn't know. But there's more. They still were punished for what they did. <clears throat> In Luke 19, verses 41 to 45, now as Jesus or Yeshua draw, drew near, he saw the city, Jerusalem. As you come up over from Bethany or Bethlehem, you come over the the east side there of, uh, of uh, Mount of Olives, and as you come over the crest of that hill, more of a large hill than a mountain, as we would think of mountains and hills. But as you come over the top of the Mount of Olives, suddenly there below you is a Temple Mount. As he drew near, he saw the city, he wept over it. When did you last weep over your nation, over your city, over your people? If Yeshua is alive in you, if Jesus mind and heart is active in you. You will act like he acted. You will 
talk like he talked and do what he did. And he said, if you had known, even you especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes, days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you and so close and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground and they will not leave you one stone upon the other because you did not know the time of your visitation. Another time he talked about, I was like a hen trying to bring her chicks under her wings and you would not, O Jerusalem. And when James and John wanted to blot out a whole Samaritan city because they wouldn't let them stay there, Jesus rebuked them. Yeshua said, you don't know the spirit you're of. Are we of that spirit? Are we of that spirit? When Nehemiah, turn to Nehemiah 1, heard about the state of disrepair of Jerusalem, he thought they'd been sent back now. The Jews had gone back. Surely they're making progress. And he heard, no, it's nothing much. The gates are still burned. And so it was, Nehemiah 1, verse 4. <clears throat> I'm just giving you example after example so you're convinced that we have to be doing these things. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and I wept. I mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Have you and I ever wept for many days and fasted over the state of the church or the state of our nation? Next he's going to ask for help, but notice how he starts. And I said, I pray, Yahweh Elohim of heaven, O great and awesome Elohim, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open, that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you, both my father's house and I have sinned. And he goes on to admit his sins, how they want to return and repent. And you read the rest through verse 11. Verse 11, O Yahweh, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant. And let the, to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of the king. Okay. If we want something to happen in the church, in the congregation, in the cities, in our nation, it all starts with my and your repentance. My repentance. Yep, yeah, your repentance. Then we can pray for the nation to repent after we've repented first. <clears throat> then we can preach repentance. This is also the Daniel prayer of Daniel 9 when he knew the 70-year punishment was about up. He didn't take it for granted. He beseeched God to open the way for Jews to return and rebuild Jerusalem. He prayed for the nation. How did he do it? He started by his repentance. He started by talking about we have failed, we have sinned. Go back and, for your homework, go back and read Daniel 9 verses 1 to 15. <clears throat> by the time Daniel's reading this, he's an old man. He's been in captivity himself about 70 years. And he remembers Jeremiah's prophecy in Jeremiah 29. How he's no longer a young man. He's an older man now, probably his 80s or 90s. Daniel is now ruled by the Persians, the area we now know as Iran, by the way. And he realizes it's time for them to go back. And so in Daniel 9, I set my face, Daniel 9, verse 3. I'll read part of it. I set my face toward Adonai Elohim, the Lord my God, Adonai Elohim in this case, to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. When was the last time you and I have done that for our nation? And I prayed to Yahweh my God. He didn't just say I prayed to Yahweh. Yahweh my God. He had an identification there, you see. And he made confession, and I said, O oh Adonai, great and awesome El, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments, 
We have sinned and committed iniquity. Verse 7, Adonai, that means Lord, my Lord, my Master. Adonai, righteousness belongs to you. I gave a sermon on righteousness, how we... It's not our righteousness, brethren. It's God's righteousness. We've got to have, seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And Daniel understood that. Adonai, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of faith as it is today. And he goes on to talk about how we didn't walk in your ways in verse 8, 9, 10. And you have cursed us. We didn't follow the law of Moses. And uh, verse 13, as it's written the law of Moses, if we didn't obey, you were going to send us out. And cast us away. I'm just paraphrasing here. In verse 15, Now Yahweh our Elohim who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name. As it is this day, we have sinned and we have done wickedly. So what happens? It says in verse 20, That while I was speaking, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, He was repenting first and then the nation and presenting my supplication before Yahweh Elohe, meaning Yahweh my God, for the holy mountain of my God, Gabriel. Gabriel, the archangel, is sent by God. He flies in the window with a brand new revelation. We wonder why we haven't gotten things like that happening. Are we fasting and praying for days on end? Are we like Jeremiah that we can't contain? Our, our eyes are just overflowing with, with tears. Brethren, now we're the ones on stage. We've read about Nehemiah and Daniel, Paul, Yeshua himself, Moses and Abraham, Samuel. I told you about my mom. <laughs> now we're the ones on stage. It's our turn. The mantle's been thrown here to us, placed on us. Let's rise to the occasion. Let's rise to the occasion. It's our turn. It's our turn to be like Father. It's our turn to show we're part of the same family, the kingdom of God. I like to say sometimes without the G. We're part and kin of His nature. For He so loved the people of the world that He sent His only Son to die for them and to be resurrected and live for them again. That's my dad. That's my father. That's my amazing Abba and yours. That's what He's like. He doesn't desire the death of the wicked. Oh, no, 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 brethren. And if we're of the same kin and family of that kingdom of God, we will have the same mind. We will be saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Turn now to Ezekiel 9. Those of you who will hear this will be noticed by Yahweh. Praying for the land will be good for us as well. Ezekiel 9, verses 3 to 11. Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. Remember, we are the temple. He called to the man clothed with linen who had the writer's inkhorn at his side. Ezekiel 9, verse 4. And Yahweh said to him, Go through the midst of the city, to the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. I want the mark of Yahweh on my forehead. You're either going to have the mark of Yahweh or the mark of the beast. I want the mark of Yahweh. The mark of Yahweh goes to those who sigh and cry for the nations and pray for repentance. Sigh and cry for the abominations that they see. And to the others, he said in my hearing, go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare nor have, mer- nor have pity. Utterly slay old and young men, maidens and little children and women. Do not come near anyone on whom is the mark. Leave them alone, but begin at my sanctuary. Brethren, begin at my sanctuary. Who is the sanctuary of God today? It's going to begin with the church, brethren, with the brethren, with the ministers of God. So they began with the elders who were before the temple. 
And he said to them, Defile the temple, fill the courts with the slain, go out. And they went out and killed in the city, including the elders, including the pastors, including the ministers, including those who thought they were in the sanctuary, but were not sighing and crying and did not have the mark on their forehead. Brethren, repent. We've got to repent, and we've got to bring Israel to repentance. We've got to feel deeply like Father feels for the country. We're of that same mind and love the nation so much. Anyway, verse 8, So it was while they were killing them that I was left alone. Now Ezekiel speaking, And I fell on my face, and I cried out, and I said, Now Ezekiel's praying for the nation. Oh, Lord God, oh, please, Adonai Yahweh, Will you destroy all the remnant of Israel in pouring out your fury on Jerusalem? So now we see Ezekiel pleading for Yahweh's mercy. Brethren, time is short. Let's repent of our self-centered preaching to date, feeding ourselves. We need to be preaching repentance to our people. We need to be pleading for Yahweh's mercy we need to be sighing and crying for what we see. We need to be willing to die for our countrymen as our big brother was. We need to be happy if our Father sends sun when needed and rain when needed on the just and the unjust. We need to be saddened and we need to pray for people when we see disaster strike them, not rejoicing gleefully or announcing that this is just the beginning as we rub our hands. We need to be praying for our enemies, even as even those who wish to harm, harm us, as Moses did, as Stephen did, as Jesus did, as all of the family's mindset people do. All of us should be doing that. Brethren, spread this word. Tell people about this concept. And you pray about it. And spread the word that we must repent and ask for the repentance of our nation. Tell people about this website. Tell people about the message. You tell them the message yourself. And you pray for this nation and for our church. Brethren, our ecclesia is so, such a mess right now. Such a mess. Yahweh, have mercy on us. Have mercy on your people. Start with your called out ones and just bring us together. Those who have your mind, bring us together. Then pray for your country to repent. Pray for God's mercy. Start with your own repentance. We have a lot of work cut out, but we're the ones who are here at the moment. Let's not let the world down. Let's not let the world down. We have to get our act together lest he come and strike the earth with utter destruction. Pray for your country to repent. Pray for God's mercy. Start with your own repentance. Love these people. Pray that God give you a love for the nation and for people. Until next time, this has been Philip with this message from Light on the Rock.